Well, hello and welcome, and thank you to our, for joining us for our podcast today. We have with us a returning guest, Mr. Bill Holter, that you saw last month. Just as a recap, Bill is a, a broker for 23 years, a branch manager for 12, and he's been working with Miles Franklin since 2012, and now he's working with them as a clearinghouse as he is a gold and silver aficionado, aficionado expert in all different types of metals. Um, if you do like in the channel, please do subs uh, like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow. And we're honored to have him back. Bill, thank you for joining us again. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me back, John. Absolutely. It's an honor. Okay, so we prepared some questions for you yep. that we want to sink our teeth into with your knowledge. So we'll start with the first one. I don't know if you saw on Sunday, but President Trump was interviewed by Maria Bartiromo. She was asking him, among other things, if he was going to bring Jay Powell back as Fed chair. He said no. And she said, why? And he said, because he missed it, amongst many obvious items. And he said that he was going to be, uh, he had two candidates in mind to, to supplant Powell. Um, our thought is that one of them might be Judy Shelton. And I wanted to get your take on that in terms of her auditing the Fed and returning the gold standard. Do you think that's a viable option for him? Um, yeah, Judy Shelton, she understands, she understands money. Uh, and when I say money, she understands understands that gold is money and the dollars were at one point derivatives of of gold um, and she understands the fact that it's it's fiat currency now um yeah she would be a great pick but in my opinion uh the ship is going to sink no matter no matter who you have as as fed chairman it's game over uh, mathematically for the dollar uh, simply because there's so much debt outstanding. The only way to pay the debt back is to create more dollars. So, I mean, whether you had a person or an algorithm uh, or AI or whatever, it really doesn't matter because the amount of dollars that are going to have to be printed are going to make the dollar worthless anyway. So, and on top of that, you, you are going to have debt that, uh, you, you will have debt that is going to default, collapse, and basically create uh, create deflation rather than inflation. So the Fed's going to have to fight that also. That's another source of the Fed being forced to create more dollars. Good point. So with that in mind, do you surmise that maybe Steve Mnuchin might return as the uh, Treasury Secretary once again? Again, I don't think it matters. Okay. Then this cake is baked. True. So it, it's it's a vicious cycle that's just going to inevitably happen, regardless of who's there. So. Well, the question is, does it happen quickly, or does it happen slowly? I can tell you that at the very end, it'll ha it'll happen over a seventy-two hour period of time. The world will spin three times, mm -hmm. and markets will across the world not open. Um. You know, the question is, do they even have the ability to kick the can down the road any further? And I suspect that's not the case. I, I think the can kicking is pretty close to being done. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, next question is, last week, as you know, BRICS surpassed the G7 for uh, domination of the global GDP, roughly having 35% now, and they have about 30 to 40 countries waiting in the wings, including the newest member, Serbia. Um, how much GDP do you think the BRICS will actually own? And what country would you be looking at to be a significant player in the new regime of countries joining? Uh, as far as uh, per percentage, I mean, I, there's there's no telling. I mean, it, it could end up being 80, 90% of, of global trade. It could end up being... 70 or 80 percent of gdp i mean it depends on how badly the west fails um and it and you also have to wonder five years from now ten years from now what g7 countries are going to join the BRICS? what g7 countries are just going to break away from the u.s because the u.s is going to be a failed entity um i think the important thing to understand is that the BRICS is rising the West is is decreasing, falling, failing, whatever you want to call it. 
Uh, and actually, let me mention this uh, just because it came out yesterday that uh, Tucker Tucker Carlson apparently interviewed Putin. And I've been on the record on at least a dozen interviews urging people to read Putin's speeches. He's done six or seven uh, public speeches that we've seen in the West. I'm sure he's done more. I'm sure that there's more that uh, you know were covered in Russia. But I think it's important that people read his past speeches. And I think it's this interview is going to be a real eye opener. And, and when I've spoken of this before, I said, read his speeches and see if there's anything in the speeches that you totally disagree with or you think is completely whacked out. I've read the speeches and the man sounds logical. Uh, what he's advocating for is free, fair, open trade. Uh, obviously, the BRICS, uh, he's, he's advocating for real money. They're, they're tired of the never pay model of the West. And the never pay model basically is, okay, so you buy, uh, you, you do a trade and you get paid in dollars and you take those dollars and you put those into the treasuries. They promise you more dollars. But since dollars are nothing, you're being paid in nothing and being promised more of nothing. So what, the, what they want, what they're advocating is they want fair settlement. They want to trade something real for something real, as opposed to the hegemony uh, that the, the West, the U.S. has has placed upon, literally placed upon the world for years and years, where they produce something, they ship it for trade, and they get paid in something that is accepted but it doesn't have inherent value on its own. So I think, I, I think uh, when this interview comes out, uh, because it's being done by Tucker Carlson, it's going to get a lot more coverage. It'll many, many, many more people are going to see it. And I think if people listen to it for five minutes, they're probably going to be hooked and want to hear more of what Putin says because he's not a madman. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, I think he, uh, I think he's a logical businessman. And like I said, he advocates something real for something real. And I think a normal open-minded person is going to be able to look at that and go, Hey, wait a minute. You know, all we heard for however many years now is Russia, 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 Putin, bad, Putin, bad. Uh, and I think that this interview is probably going to open up a lot of eyes. I agree completely. And uh, I saw some of the backstory on, you know, Telegram and other channels where he was in Russia and the media there was really receptive to him being there. So I, I agree. I think that uh, that's going to be a monumental game changer for the perception of Russia. And people are going to finally awaken slowly to the truth that's been really going on all along. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in alignment with you on that. John, one, one other thing on that. Uh, sure. The 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 response has been, uh, I mean, and you even had some U.S. senators say, uh, "Okay, so Tucker's doing the interview. He's a traitor, and we shouldn't let him back into the country." I mean, what I'm getting at is, they don't want you to hear it. Uh, they want to punish Tucker for being a journalist in a world where. You know, the only journalists that exist are today are people like you that are willing to ask real questions as opposed to, you know, what flavor ice cream are you eating? Yeah, exactly. No, it's a mutiny on free speech and 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 there needs to be a, a revolution, a standoff here. And I think we're going to see it, as you said, in this year for sure, because like I agree with it. There's there's no more uh, delaying this. The, we've reached a tipping point. So, yeah, absolutely. Um Bill, last month you mentioned, and I, I've been kind of chewing on this for a while, uh, you mentioned that the real unemployment rate was rather the actual unemployment rate, not the fake numbers they post, is closer to 20%. And I would agree with that. 
Uh, as of January, uh, it looks like the layoffs have totaled in the U.S. roughly 82,000. How far does this go, and what company or companies do you think Americans will see that will shine a light on how bad this economy really is? Uh, it's hard to pick any particular company. First off, let me just say, if you want to get the real numbers, go to John Williams' shadow stats. Um, you will get the numbers crunch. I mean, John is the quintessential bean counter as far as economic statistics are concerned. Um, you'll get the, the real inflation rate. You'll get uh, the real unemployment numbers. You'll get real GDP numbers. And when I'm saying real, he calculates all of these numbers the way they did back in the 1970s and early 1980s before they started changing, massaging the way the numbers were tabulated. So, uh, I, I and I think the last I saw, uh, John had the numbers uh, north of 17%. And I mean, all you have to do really is look at what, how many people are they saying are employed? You're saying the em, employment is what, 130 million or something like that? Um, that's less than half the population. So you, I mean, you've got less than half the population is actually working. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether I spoke about it with you or it was on another interview, but you've got to keep in mind that the we're, we live in a two-tiered uh, economy, if you will. We have the private economy and we have the public economy. The public economy obviously is backed by government hiring, whether it be uh, state, local, uh, or, or on the federal level. But if you look at the deficits that the U.S. Uh, government, the U.S. Treasury is running, a lot of that money does bleed into the economy. And one way it bleeds into the economy is by hiring new workers that are probably not essential. They're, they're not even needed. But that's money that goes into the system and it becomes part of GDP. So yeah, they can say GDP is running at 2%, 3%. Oh, it's really running hot at 3.2 or whatever the number is. Um, but keep in mind, that's a, a lot of that is borrowed money. It's borrowed in deficit form. It's not, it's not, uh, we're not self-funding. We haven't self-funded literally since 1960 was the last year uh, the U.S. went without running a uh a fiscal deficit. So just understand that it's a two-tiered economy. And when you put the two together, yeah, they can show growth. But if you took uh, government hiring, government expenditures out, the private economy is without a doubt in a recession and more than likely uh, sniffing at, at levels that would be classified uh, in, a, in a classic sense as a depression. Exactly, exactly right. Um, thank you. Um, Bill, with all the corruption going on in the world, you're seeing governments, whole governments in Europe step down. Uh, you're seeing uh, in England what's going on over there with the king and, and that usurpation. Uh, we're gonna see it, I think, here in America here pretty shortly and also in the Vatican. Um, Watching very closely the SEC, because we know how corrupt they are, and, and they're definitely part of the equation. Do you, do you foresee uh, Gary Gensler being fired or stepped down soon? Because I know Congress was discussing that at some point. Uh, well, Gary Gensler is the guy who was head of CFTC back in, what was it, 2010, 2011, when they did a study on silver for five years, and their findings were... Uh, we, we found nothing, I think he said actionable. I think that's what the terminology was. He didn't say they didn't find anything illegal, but they didn't find anything actionable. Uh, and the, obviously the reason being, if the silver suppression is uh, a government-backed scheme, then how, you know, it can't be actionable. They can't. They can't charge anyone because 
you know, it was it was sanctioned by sanctioned by the government. So that's his background. Is that uh, they found it? They found nothing. And now, since 2010 or 11, whenever it was, how many times? I, I mean, how many times has J.P. Morgan? That's just one company. How many times have they pled guilty to uh, manipulating the gold and silver markets? Like four times or five times? Uh, so your question was, will he be replaced? I mean, I would certainly hope so. Uh, the laws, the laws are on the books. The laws for the SEC are on the books. The laws for the border are on the books. The problem is the laws aren't being enforced and you're you're getting close to a tipping point and who knows which you know which area it's going to be uh, but you're close to a tipping point where you get people like in you know the old days running around with uh, nooses and pitchforks mm. people people are are getting to the boiling point. now you know what will what will it actually be I don't know uh, but understand that people are complacent now because they get their statement every month, whether it be you know in the mail or uh, email electronically or whatever. People get their statements, they see their 401k, and you know the markets are are certainly levitated. They're I mean they're they're in huge bubble territory. But the average person looks at their statement and says, "Oh well, I'm rich. It doesn't affect me, so who cares." And what's going to happen is we're going to have that weekend where you go to bed on a Friday night and many things don't even open on Monday morning. And and then you'll see people pissed off because it finally affected them. It's like the not in my backyard syndrome. You know, it's okay if it's happening uh, somewhere else as long as it doesn't happen in my backyard. I completely agree, Bill, because I, I use a, a similar analogy with some of my friends that I call it the flood syndrome. Like you'll be watching the news report for weather back in the old days and you see a flood in the center of town. You think, well, that's not affecting me. So back to my life. And then a couple hours later, you look across the street and your neighbor gets hit and now you start to pay attention. And then next it's you. And so I can see a scenario exactly like that to your point. So I'm glad you brought that up, Bill, because that segues nicely to another question. Speaking of, you know, 401ks and pensions and IRAs and all that debt-based system. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I heard you say on one other show that the default of the dollar-based debt system is a mathematical certainty. Um, what concerns me is that when this occurs, my guess would be that the government will not be able to provide entitlement programs such as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, among other things. Would you agree, and would you think that would be a tipping point to the civil unrest? Yeah, uh, I guess you could say indirectly, because I don't think the entitlement programs won't pay, but they're going to print the dollars to make the payments. So if somebody's getting, you know, pick a number, whatever it is, I don't even know, $200 a week for food or whatever, uh, because the purchasing power of the dollar is going to collapse, and they're only able to buy at a future date sixty dollars worth of food in today's terms, then you're gonna have then you'll have those masses pissed off because you know hungry people get angry. And so and just to clarify, when I say mathematically uh the US is gonna default, they're gonna default in one of two ways. They're either going to not pay, or they're going to they'll pay, but and they'll pay in dollars, but they'll print so many dollars that it loses purchasing power, or you know collapses in purchasing power. We're at the point now, and you can now see it. Um, it can no longer be poo pooed. We're at the point now. We're paying over one trillion dollars a year in interest only. That's the biggest expenditure of the U.S. Treasury. It's now bigger. Than the U.S. military, which is bigger than all the military spending for the rest of the world, so the U.S. is spending uh, more on interest than it does on the military, which is the biggest uh, expenditure. 
well, it, it's more than all the militaries combined. Wow. So from a standpoint of a trillion dollars, putting that in perspective, last year's uh, income tax take was, I think, 4.7 trillion. So they're now paying more than 20% of tax revenues in interest. That's the mathematical non-viability of where we are now because the, that interest expense is not going to go down in the future. There's no way it can go down in the future. The, the interest expense is only going to get greater and greater. How long the markets allow that, that, that remains to be seen. But at some point in time, and it may be this year, I think there's what, six, I think it's six trillion uh, of debt that's got to be rolled over on top of call it another one and a half or two trillion deficit. So you got one and a half or two trillion of new borrowings. And then they're going to have to refinance six trillion. Where is the six trillion going to come from? What happens if there's no buyers? If there's no buyers for the debt, then Uncle Sam got his credit card shut off. The buyer of last resort will be who? The Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, to put that in perspective, because of the rise in interest rates last year, they lost $113 billion on their bond portfolio, and that more than wiped out their equity. So it was laughable previous to 2023 that the Fed had, the last number I saw was $65 billion in equity, and that's what held up. That was the, the, the needle point at the bottom of the uh, inverted uh, Exeter's pyramid, if you will. Mm -hmm. 65 billion was holding the whole system up. Now it's nothing. Now the Federal Reserve has a negative net worth holding the system up. And if the Treasury needs to borrow or, or refinance that additional $6 trillion, how does the Fed, I mean, how does that make sense? They have no equity, but they create $6 trillion to keep the, literally the Ponzi scheme going. Yeah. Yeah, it's unsustainable. I mean, it's like you said, a point of no return. Um, and, and thank you again. So kind of a follow up to that. I'm glad you brought up the debt situation because we have an interesting parallel with Russia and China, who we know are obviously integral in the BRICS and want this de-dollarization to occur and rightly so. Um, I don't know if you saw, I'm probably sure you did, the IMF recently reported that Russia is poised this year to be one of the strongest currencies in the world. They were in 2022 with the ruble. Now with the inevitability of gold backing, it looks to be more so. Meanwhile, we have China, who recently on their CSI uh, thousand index, they lost th uh, ne nearly 30% of market share with that. Um, so with that in mind, Bill, do you think China is the big threat? Uh, it seems like their economy might actually be worse than ours. What will happen if China, to China when our debt bubble does pop? And what are some of the likely countries that will survive uh, during this change? Hey, this, is a, this is a really broad question. Um, first off, I believe Russia's debt to GDP is only 17%. Uh, the US is over 100%. And if you look at like total debt in China, I mean, they have blown the biggest real estate bubble in the history of history. Now, for years and years, I said, yeah, China, China was in on the borrowing bench. But what they did was they built stuff. They built, uh, they literally built cities. They built airports. They built railroads. They built bridges. They built infrastructure. While we squandered we, you know, we use debt, but we squandered it. We ate our seed corn. So <clears throat> you're thinking of it from the standpoint, how will China fare when we blow up? I would ask the reverse question. How will we fare when China blows up? I mean, the question is who blows up first? I don't know. You know, I don't have a, a crystal ball. I just know that both are, uh, they're both unsustainable. Um, you can look at, at, commercial real estate here in the United States. There was a building, uh, and I think it was owned by uh, BlackRock or Blackstone, I forget which one. Um, they bought it in 2015 for 605 million. They put uh, 305 million down. They borrowed 300 million. 
because of COVID and, and you know, the emptied buildings and tenants leaving, they stopped paying in 2022. They've now been uh, foreclosed on. They walked away from the walked away from the debt, walked away from the property. And the banks are now offering that debt for $150 million. So that $605 million building in 2015 is now valued at most at $150 million. So that's a 75% drop. And you're gonna you're seeing the same thing you saw Evergrande. They just went or just started through foreclosure. Uh, I mean, China's got exactly the same problems. The only difference is China has new infrastructure. We don't. We've not kept up with with our roads, bridges, uh, rails. You know, we've not we've not spent money on the infrastructure, whereas China did. So this thing's going to go down. the the paper The paper assets are going to implode, and you're going to see banks uh, co collapse. You'll see brokers, insurance companies, etc., collapse, and then you got to start over again. The difference being, China will start over with new infrastructure, and and we start over with with infrastructure that's 50, 75, 100 years old and has not been maintained. So it's the U.S. and China are are both way over leveraged. And I think it's really important to understand because Russia was, you could say they were forced into bankruptcy in the 90s. They had to start all over and they weren't allowed to borrow much money. So here we are in 2024 and Russia is sitting on a total debt uh, debt to GDP ratio of 17%. That's uh, that's under leveraged mm. versus the US and China and the rest of the world being over leveraged. Good point, good point. And yeah, you're right. Ultimately the question is who blinks first and I guess we're gonna find out. Like you said in the last show, <clears throat> it really doesn't matter because within 72 hours, it's all gonna fold into each other. Exactly. So you're right, you're right about, I, I agree with you. Um, Bill, let's pivot back a second to one of your main or one of your many uh, areas of expertise, particularly with respect to, which of course we once again agree, precious metals is the key, physical, tangible precious metals at that, not the certificates. Um, we know that silver is being manipulated and we know the banks are buying it to try to control it up central banks. They always do their shenanigans. Uh, kind of a two-part question. What, do you, what, is the, what is the pricing point that you're looking for, the tipping point for silver to, like it's quoted, to break free from the suppression? And two, um, China and other Eastern countries, uh, do you think they want that price to be low so that they can buy it as well? Or, or what, do you, what do you see as the real nucleus of the problem here? Well, I think for years, uh, China liked seeing low gold prices so they could get more ounces for whatever they're paying for it with. Um, and you have all sorts of industry uh, medicinal purposes, high tech purposes, you know, those companies for years and years, literally forever, has wanted a cheap silver price. Because you know, silver goes is used in so many uh, applications, and there's no huge uh, central bank stockpiles of silver. So you you've had you've had all sorts of entities wanting a cheap silver price, and that's what they've gotten with the naked shorting. What's happening now is, I mean, with this green revolution, I mean, just look at solar panels alone. Uh, the the amount of silver usage is probably 50 or even 100% higher than what the Silver Institute estimates as far as total usage. So I think the supply and demand numbers that we're seeing uh, are bogus. And, and you're asking, at what price point do I think the metals will, will break loose or break out? Uh, I think you could you could obviously say if you saw a 2100 uh, print close and stay there for two, three, four days, I think you'd, you'd have all sorts of action 
in gold and you'd have you'd have chasing it uh in silver it's hard to say maybe over 26 dollars, certainly over 30 dollars. but i don't really think the only thing that price will do is it will change sentiment whereas this is a supply and demand situation and i've maintained for probably 15 years or more that once there's a failure to deliver that you know that would be game over and then price price will go to numbers you've never thought about not you know very very few people if anyone has ever ever thought about i mean think about this go back to uh what was it 1917 or 1918 one ounce of gold in german reichmarks was 170 reichmarks by 1923 what was the number it was over three trillion reichmarks so who could have ever forecast oh well my charts say it's going to three trillion or whatever the number was there's no way to forecast uh how how high the number will go in dollars um but that's not to say that everything else goes higher the cost of a cup of coffee the cost of an hour labor um the cost of eggs the cost of, of whatever because it's a function of the currency collapsing but again I, I just believe that uh the the event and yeah it'll be preceded maybe by a very very short period of time by price but the event's going to be a supply uh no supply or lack of supply event as opposed to a pricing event yeah, so taking delivery is really going to be the issue, it seems like. Right. Yeah. Yeah, again, think about it. With COMEX, I mean, how many how many paper ounces are represented by, or how many ounces are represented by paper versus the ounces that they actually have for delivery? You know, a lot of what they have or are holding are not deliverable. They're, they're just being stored. Hmm. Good point. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, one other thing, somebody brought this up, uh, I guess, within the last week with me. Um, they said something about, oh, well, do you remember when, do you remember when Germany asked for, I think the number was 300 tons back in 2013 or 14? And the response was, oh, well, it's going to take at least three years. Well, their their explanation was, oh, it's too bulky and it's too dangerous. To, to 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 move that much all at once well first off in dollar terms it's you know it's not a huge number mm. but i did the math and if you took uh boeing 747s cargo planes which can hold 97 tons it would have taken three full loads and a partial load to get it done and once it was finally done, and I think it was almost three years later, the bars were not the bars that Germany first deposited. The serial numbers were different. So that gold obviously had been moved, lent out, whatever, melted down, and it took them three years to replace it. And you're talking about a lousy 300 tons. So... I think the best way to look at it is the supply is certainly not plentiful, but yet the paper system is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And which means you've got more and more, more and more entities that 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago would have been considered complete small fries are now big enough to tip the thing over. You've got more entities that could set, step up and say, Hey, I want my gold. So it's like you got more lottery tickets to, you know, to tip the thing over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, last question for today, Bill, because I want to respect your time and just kind of follow up on the backs of what we talked about with, uh, uh, you know, debts and implosions and all, and all of its various iterations. Um, you mentioned Evergrande, which I'm glad you brought up. And I think it was, what, $300 billion or something like that they have to cover that they're not going to be able to. And we know why. Uh, there's some people have been talking a lot about Deutsche Bank overseas, and then we have Bank of America here. I was I was on a show with Greg Manorino earlier this week, and he believes that Bank of America is going to be one of the first American banks to actually fail front of scenes. My question is, do you think that 
that's true about those banks? Or do you, do you think it's more of a case of it doesn't matter who goes first because they're all going to implode around the same time? Yeah, well, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, you could be clairvoyant and pick the bank that blows up, but it's not going to make any difference whether you pick the bank because it's going to affect all banks. Uh, the rumors with Deutsche Bank, yes, they have a lot of derivatives. Uh, bank of America, yes, they have lots of derivatives. Uh, one of the one of the rumored derivatives is that they've they are short uh, close to a billion ounces of silver. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I can't prove it one way or the other. Uh, you've got this uh, the the bank in New York. It's been imploding over the last four or five days, stock price wise. I think their stock's down now. 70 or 80 percent from where it was a week ago and that was a bank that stepped up and bought parts of signature bank a year ago so they were healthy enough supposedly a year ago to pick up you know assets for pennies on the dollar on on bailing out signature bank was which was one of the four banks that went last year and now they're going so i don't think i don't think it makes a difference whether you can predict the bank because they're all in bed together. If, if bank A fails, their counterparty bank B or bank C or bank Z, it doesn't matter. If a bank, if a bank fails and can't perform on a contract, that contract becomes worth nothing, which means the counterparty, which may have been a huge winner, you know, they may have bet on, you know, the right asset or the right interest rate or the right market or whatever. And they're thinking, yeah, you know, we scored big. The only problem is you scored big, but when you went to cash in your chips, the window was closed and it was empty behind the window because it's a non-performing entity. So the, the whole thing is a shell. The whole thing is an empty shell. And it's just going to take one to go down to illustrate that they're all worth nothing. Yeah, yeah, very, very. And very. and just one one Wait. other thing you had mentioned, and I, I wanted to mention this earlier. Sure. Uh, after after this thirty minutes or whatever that we talked about, of you've got paper contracts, you've got derivatives, etc., that are going to end up being nothing. That's why you own gold. That's why you own silver because they can never default. They can never bankrupt. Gold and silver have value be, because they are. And when I say they are, they're representations of labor, capital, and equipment that's already been spent to dig it out of the ground, mine it, uh, refine it, and mint it. Um, and, and that's the idea behind uh, money as a store of value as opposed to currencies which you can trade in it, currencies are not a store of value okay good to know thank you bill really appreciate your time as always um bill uh, final thoughts you have for the audience and where can people find out more about you uh, my final thoughts uh, everybody's asking you know for final thoughts on these interviews and i just basically i'm to the point now just do the best you can. Um, understand that you, at some point in time, you're going to be on your own. And, you know, I've said quite a few times, go home on a Friday, turn your lights off, shut the water valve off, shut everything off and see how you survive for the weekend with no services. Because that's, that's a very real possibility that you don't have electricity, you don't have water, 99.9% um, .9 chance that when this thing goes down, you dial 911 and nobody even answers because, you know, first responders are going to be at their own homes mm -hmm. with their own family dealing with their own situation. So just uh, do the best you can as far as, as, as far as trying to go it on your own because that's where we're headed. Um, and if you want to see my work, uh, see the postings, my thought process, uh, simple, just go to billholter.com. 
Um, if you want to contact me directly, uh, if you have a question or if you want to uh, do, uh, you know, precious metals transactions, you can contact me at bholter at proton.me. Great. And folks, I just want to say to you, with respect to our channel, uh, we have many platforms, but Bill said it himself earlier in, the, in this podcast that Tucker Carlson is being attacked by our own politicians from within, a mutiny on free speech. If it's happening to him, what's to say it couldn't happen to us? We, as he said, we're a constitutional republic and we have certain rights guaranteed to us, but we need to exercise them. That's why we are creating our own channel, Real World Academy, to break away from the system, to give you free speech, to have direct access to us, and also reach out to other business owners of like-minded and just synergize with other patriots. We all have felt ostracized and um, outcast and rejected because we have chosen to go away from the whole of society's uh, programmed agenda and mind control. So that's what this channel is wholly being designed for. So please do join us at www.realworldac.com and we'll leave that link in the description. Bill, thanks again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, John.